for over a year, really. And people are, you know, there's this misconception that we go from expansion to recession, like flipping a switch, as well as, you know, recession fatigue. People have been talking about recession all the, all this time, and it, it doesn't seem to have happened. So it must mean it's not going to happen. That Therefore, when Janet Yellen comes out and says the economy is in a good place and you think, well, we didn't go into recession, maybe she's right. But when you look at the economic statistics and these, more importantly, the trajectory of them, what you see is that we're on a slow decline toward some unknown destination. Welcome to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. Thank you so much for joining me here. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. We have an interesting discussion lined up today. We have a new guest joining us. He hasn't been on the program before. It's Jeff Snyder of Eurodollar University. And we're going to discuss a few various topics here. One of them is, of course, the monetary system, but uh, also how it impacts everything else. We've got a, a long list of items we need to discuss. So stay tuned. Like It's going to be jam-packed because the topics are plentiful that we need to touch on to make sense of what is going on these days. It's not as simple as one might suspect. Before I switch over to my guest, hit that subscribe button. It's somewhere below me. I've been told it's not where I was pointing. So just somewhere. It says subscribe on it. It's a capital S it usually starts with. Hit that button because 80 to 85% of you are not subscribed to the channel. Let's change that so we can bring guests like Jeff on more regularly or guests of other great caliber as well. It helps us tremendously. Thank you for that. And now let me introduce Jeff. Jeff, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Kai. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're going to have a really tough time packing everything into 30 minutes here, Jeff. And uh, we, we need to start with uh, explaining what you're actually doing. And uh, your, your title, you're, you're at all university. You're the host of a, a YouTube channel as well. And I think we need to jump in and start explaining what Euro dollar is first. Yeah, the Euro dollar is a misunderstood concept for the few people who have actually heard of it. Though the tide is changing. Uh, you know, when I first started this many, many years ago, nobody knew what a Euro dollar was. And that was true pretty, pretty much up until recently. Uh, but now people have started to realize that the monetary system, as you were just explaining, Kai, is much more complicated than we've ever been told or led to believe. Most people, their idea of the monetary system is Jay Powell, the Federal Reserve, or Ben Bernanke, or Alan Greenspan, if you're old like me and go back into the 1990s. But as it turns out, there's this entire global monetary architecture, the plumbing, so to speak, that has existed. It's, uh, it's been out there. It's, it's been doing all of the roles of a reserve currency for many, many decades in the shadows in the, you know, it, it, hidden from public view, all behind the Federal Reserve. It's essentially the euro dollar in a very, you know, very uh, brief summation is the global monetary system. It really is the reserve currency system because it allows capital money to flow from one place around the world to another, intermediating through this common medium that is maintained by uh, a cartel of large global banks. They're the ones that actually create the credit and money that goes into it. And they're the ones who keep track of who owes what throughout the system. And it's been this way, like I said, from the very beginning, going back to the 1950s and 1960s. So the euro dollar is this very complicated shadow money world that operates the roles of a reserve currency. Therefore, it's, it's something that touches everything. It's not just a US dollar, it's not just a US problem. It's outside the United States. It's all over the world. It's the reserve currency. It's 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 there's there's really no place it doesn't connect to. Interesting. Yeah, I have to admit, like whenever anybody asks me how the euro dollar is doing, I think they mean the euro. Nobody really <laughs> talks about the euro dollar, right? So there's a certain ignorance. So, so for me, this is also let's call it a new term. I'm learning something here as well, which I appreciate. Um, but let's break it down a little bit. I'm just more curious, like, who are the members of this cartel? Is it just the central banks or who's controlling the flow of funds here? Yeah, there's, it's not central banks. And I think that's one of the major misconceptions that we have is that central banks are these all-powerful monetary gods. They have the printing press, as Ben Bernanke said in 2002. Well, that's just not true. In fact, the, the, the flow of money as well as the creation of money is undertaken by these banks who operate in the system. And it was a it was an inside club when it first began, and it's slowly expanded over time. But these are the largest banks around the world. We, we kind of classify them as dealer banks because they undertake money, money, money dealing activities. So it's, you know, think any large bank. It's, it's not just JP Morgan or Citibank. It's also Mitsubishi, MFJ in Japan or 
Credit Suisse, when Credit Suisse was a, a bank, UBS in Switzerland, some of the large U European banks, um, essentially any bank that's interested in or any bank that's involved in global transactions, whether it be financial or, or you know monetary payment system, all of that kind of stuff, that um, when, we're, when we're talking about global reserve currency and the movement and, and flow of credit and money throughout the world, it's trans transferring through these large global banks and they operate financial utilities, they operate different systems in order to maintain that payment system, to, to maintain the, uh, con not necessarily control, but maintain the operational ability to transact all throughout the entire world. So just think of the largest banks in the world and that's what we're really talking about. Interesting, because my mind always goes to bills and coins when we talk currency, right? And be it the US dollar, being at the euro, like how, how is that, uh... How does that sort of work? Like explain it in very, like like I'm five years old. If you could explain that, like how, how does that work? Is it just a form of credit or is it just liquidity uh, or liquidity providing in that regard, meaning, okay, we'll provide you with euros or dollars. So the currency itself is irrelevant. Um, it's actually one above that level. So I'm curious, uh, how would you break that down? Yeah, Kai, you, that's exactly, it. it's not physical currency. In fact, from the very beginning, the reason why it became so efficient and so transformative was because it moved beyond physical currency. So we're just talking about ledger money. Essentially, we're keeping track of who owes what. In theory, it's convertible into uh, into actual physical currency, whatever denomination, because um, technically a euro dollar is a claim on a US dollar, except that you know in the modern industrial advanced economies, we don't use physical currency. And by we, we mean pretty much everybody. We all basically transact through this ledger system that these banks take. Uh, these these banks keep keep in, tra in track. So it's not the flow of actual currency. It's not like you know J.P. Morgan is sending a pallet of cash to UBS in Switzerland when they have a transaction. They just they sh they have a computer ledger. It looks a lot like a telecommunications network where you have a bunch of computers talking to each other, um, sending numbers and packets of information back and forth. And all they're really trying to do is manage the uh, the numbers on the screen and make sure they balance at the end of the day. Um, so it's it's a ledger money system, really a virtual fictional currency system because there's no actual physical currency. And as long as we trust that the banks are keeping track of everything correctly. We don't need to convert into any type of actual physical currency. So the monetary system itself is claims, technically claims on, on actual currency, but we don't actually use the currency. So we're transacting in this ledger level, this virtual currency where it's just, it's a bunch of ones and zeros essentially. Interesting, like my mind went to two questions now. One is the collapse of Credit Suisse and uh, how it sort of has to do with the monetary system there and the euro dollar system, how, how sort of uh, threatened it was by that. And B, talking about threatened, like how do the BRICS, or actually is the, the euro dollar system a Western system and uh, how do the BRICS compete with it? Well, the Credit Suisse, um, that question, I don't think we still, we don't have enough information to really understand what exactly happened there, but just piecing together what their business was and, you know, it's, it's, it's the age old story of once a bank becomes a questionable name, it's difficult to stay in business because counterparties are always demanding more of you than they would, you would than and any the, ter the terms you would normally get. And that was certainly true of Credit Suisse over the last couple of years because everybody had, everybody knew that Credit Suisse was not a solid firm. So the question really was, what was the final nail in the coffin and why did it come in March of 2023 when, you know, U.S. regional banks were experiencing all sorts of troubles, which suggests that there was something more than just specifically U.S. regional banks, that there was some kind of a systemic hiccup in the wider euro dollar system that wasn't just specifically about, you know, deposits migrating away from Silicon Valley Bank to money market funds. And so there's a number of possibilities that could explain Credit Suisse, including collateral shortages, which, by the way, is what really happens and most often happens in any individual bank failure. You usually run out of collateral and that, that's lights out. Um, and there's any number of reasons to think that's what happened with Credit Suisse. But again, I don't think we have enough information to make a determination. But that was one of the things about March 2020 that really perked up, I think, more than Silicon Valley Bank, that really per perked up everybody's ears. Like, okay, wait a minute, what just happened here with this big uh, Swiss, Swiss firm? Because like I said, we, we knew it was a troubled firm, but why specifically March 2023 did that, was that the final nail in the coffin? And then the other part of it, before we get to sorry, before we get to the bricks, real, real quick, was there any risk to the euro dollar system when that uh, when Credit Suisse collapsed? 
Was there oh, sure. any systemic I mean, risk? There were a number of indications, mostly that, that uh, had to do with U.S. dollar collateral. That's usually treasury bills and treasury notes on the run of uh, U.S. treasuries that suggested that there was an enormous collateral shortage and some of the knock on indications, too. And it wasn't just specifically in U.S. dollars. We saw, you know, for example, Italian uh, German spreads. Uh, Italian bonds are a significant portion of euro denominated collateral. And remember, that with the euro dollar system, we don't really make distinctions between different currency denominations because these banks operate in all these different denominations and move fluidly, or at least in theory, move fluidly back and forth between them. So if, if there's a major problem, a systemic problem with a European bank, and it looks like it's a European denominated issue, chances are it's going to have, it's, it has, there's a potential uh, for it to spread throughout the entire euro dollar system all across the, 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 uh, the, the, entire, um, the entire system, for lack of a better term. <laughs> So essentially, yeah, there was collateral shortage indications in March and especially April of 2023 that suggested uh, there's there's something more to the story than just deposits migrating away from Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and part of, I mean, at the time, the Treasury Department was issuing fewer Treasury bills, so there's you know supply issues as well. But there were indications that you know there was there was a possibility that it could have gone further. And there's a possibility even now that it could still flare up again. So I don't think the, the story of March and April, 2023 hasn't com been completely written just yet. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. Let's, let's see how this plays out further. Cause I think the banking crisis we're not done with as long as the bond yields are at the, at the current levels. So there, I think we're at risk of seeing more failures personally. That's my opinion. Right. Um, I, I threw in the bricks here as well, and whether the uh, the euro dollar system, the name sort of suggests it. It seems like a, a rhetorical question here, but uh, is it is it just a Western phenomenon plus Japan? Yeah, it is. It's a basically developed world, or what? The, what do they call now the global North? Essentially, the global North system. That uh, I mean, it, it just, that's just the way it developed through that part of the economy. And the Japanese were at least smart enough in the early days, looking for a way to finance their growth after the after World War II to just connect to it and ride that wave as the Chinese did in the 1990s. And a lot of countries did in the 1990s. So while it is a global North construct, it is again, a reserve currency. So it means it does have impacts everywhere. And the problem that the BRICS have with it is that it, up until 2008, everybody seemed to benefit from globalization that was financed by this Euro dollar system that was expanding probably more rapidly than it need to, not probably, it expanded more rapidly than it need to, created all sorts of you know, asset bubbles and credit bubbles. But essentially, nobody complained about the dollar when it, was, when it appeared to be working for everybody. But right in August of 2007, the euro dollar system broke down. The spoiler alert, it, 2008 crisis was not really about subprime mortgages. It was a global dollar shortage. And essentially, the, the euro dollar system never healed itself. It never fixed itself. It never went back to its pre-crisis condition because it couldn't. So essentially, we've, we've dealt with the problem of the, over the last 16 years of a global reserve currency system that doesn't work in the way that it had before. And so a malfunctioning lower, uh, lower capacity reserve currency system creates enormous problems, including in, uh, in, ter in terms of economic growth. And as economic growth has diminished over the last 16 years, countries around the world, first of all, they have a dollar problem that they can't seem to fix, well, because they have no ability to fix. And number two, they're not getting the benefits of, of, being, uh, of being plugged into this euro dollar system that they were before. So they're beginning to look for alternatives to both manage their dollar problem, as well as see if they can possibly do something about, do find some other kind of arrangement to, to maintain their own economic, uh, economic interests in the face of a reserve currency problem. The issue though, is that you're not replacing the dollar. It's not like go governments around the world can just swap currency. What you're trying to do is you have to replace the capabilities of the Euro dollar system, which is a whole different ball game. And I think most people don't really understand what that means and what most people don't really uh, don't really think too too much about what a reserve currency is and what it needs to do, as well as how it is supposed to do those jobs. And when you actually think about these things, it becomes much clearer why the euro dollar system it's so hard to replace. In fact, it it's not something that the BRICS are going to be able to do. It's not really something that anybody else is going to be able to do overnight. Uh, which is why we've been talking about this for the last fifteen years, and we're no closer to a solution than we were before. So again, there's, there's two issues here. 
The Chinese have led the way, not in replacing the dollar, but trying to reduce their dollar footprint by engaging in bilateral trade and, and things, uh, you know, uh, transfers in uh, yuan terms rather than using trying to mediate through the euro dollar, as well as other countries that are kind of following, around, following along, trying to limit their dollar footprint. But as far as replacing the euro dollar system and its capabilities, that's a far, far off in the future type of thing. So it's really how do we get along in the near term as best as we possibly can. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. that's a perfect segue to, to sort of the next step. And it's zooming in now a little bit. How does the monetary system affect us? How does it affect the economy? And uh, to, to that, uh, so in, or in that regard, Janet Yellen gave an exclusive interview to Sky News, I think, over the weekend. And she said one thing, it's the U.S. economy is in a good place. And this would be the point usually where we start our interview is, is, is the U.S. economy in a good place? Do you agree? Where, where, where are we at? How are we doing? No, I don't think the U.S. economy is in a good place at all, but it's it's understandable why people have that impression, because as you go through these economic cycles, you start out with an expansion. And I think people have in their mind that we go directly from expansion to recession. And we've been talking about recession for how long now? For over a year, really. And people are, you know, there's this misconception that we go from expansion to recession, like flipping a switch, as well as, you know, recession fatigue. People have been talking about recession all the, all this time, and it, it doesn't seem to have happened. So it must mean it's not going to happen. That Therefore, when Janet Yellen comes out and says the economy is in a good place, and you think, well, we didn't go into recession, maybe she's right. But when you look at the economic statistics, and these, more importantly, the trajectory of them, what you see is that we're on a slow decline toward some unknown destination. And the unknown destination could be as Jay Powell and Janet Yellen agree, that could just be the soft landing. So yes, the economy has slowed down thanks to the Federal Reserve and its rate hikes, and that'll lead us into a disinflationary Goldilocks scenario soft landing. And in this transition period between expansion and recession, it looks like a soft landing until it goes beyond the soft landing into the un unquestionable recession part. And so you look at the economic data, some of it looks pretty good, some of it looks questionable, it's more ambiguous than not, you can say that's a soft landing. You could say it's not a soft landing. The data itself doesn't tell you that. That it doesn't tell you that specifically right now. There's all sorts of statistics that suggest we could go beyond a soft landing, which is where we we bring in the marketplace to give us sort of a a a, a, a means to interpret economic statistics looking forward. So if the economy is slowing down and we're interested in figuring out where does it stop slowing down or does it stop slowing down, that's where we need to, we need to get information from the marketplace to, to, to have a better sense of what are the underlying conditions right now on the ground, as well as what is the entire marketplace seeing is risk over the uh, near term and intermediate term moving into the future. And when you do that, not only do you have a slowdown in the statistics, the markets are still saying that you know, soft landings, number one, soft landings don't happen. <laughs> they, they, it's not that they're rare, they don't actually happen. And number two, that's still the forecast from all the markets that you look at, all the curves, all the inversions, all the stuff that you probably heard about. They're still forecasting that not a soft landing. At some point, the economy becomes unquestionably recession-like. And by the way, that's already happened in certain places around the world. It's just not an immediate uh, it's not an immediate process. It doesn't just happen all at once. It takes time for all of these things to really align. Ro rolling recession is, is a point that I made note of, and I, I keep coming back to because I heard it in some interview, and it, it's starting to make a bit more sense because I looked at U.S. gas prices and the averages just provided by AAA. And to California, for example, is on the high end with 562, national average being at 360 a gallon. I think Texas, that's where I noticed at first we're at 306 a gallon. Um, so is there like a regional recession happening? Because obviously anybody who, who works and operates in California is at a massive disadvantage uh, in comparison to anybody who works in Texas or Alabama, for example. Yeah, there are always regional differences. And the, the danger is you could have a regional recession that then spills over into the other parts of the, of the economy. I mean, you think about 2008, for example, the Great Recession. It was mostly a southern recession up until really the summer of 2008. So, you know, where the, the housing bubble had its big, biggest impact, that's where the recession really began. And it didn't, it didn't, it started out in the same kind of way where it didn't seem like a recession to most people because it, it really wasn't. It was sort of that limited scope, uh, neg negative pressures that then 
they went too far. They went past that unknowable threshold where it became a national, really a global economic phenomenon. And so, Kai, you're right. You look at, you know, what are the what are the biggest uh, biggest problems that we have in the U.S. economy? And really, remember, we have to think about this globally. But in the U.S. economy right now, we've got another gasoline energy price spike. At least we did up until around August and uh, early part of September. And at a time when I think, uh, contrary to what Janet Yellen's saying, we can't really <laughs> afford another another big uh, in increase like that. And so it's going to impact businesses and consumers who are paying the most. If you know if that means California and some of the high gas states, it maybe that's where the trouble really begins, or the trouble that's already there goes past that unknowable threshold and becomes it becomes the more familiar recession that uh, we're all looking for. And it's it's to me it's likely that gasoline prices are probably the the final straw that breaks the camel's back because like I said we. After everything that's happened over the last year, slowing down, moving in that direction, we really can't, we couldn't afford the summertime gas price. Now, although leisure travel was quite high over the summer, despite the high prices. So re really interesting comments there. Um, I, I'm just looking at your Twitter feed and you, you, you just co uh, commented uh, yesterday, just looking at the date. Yeah, yesterday, October 15th, about the CPI, September CPI. And I want to break that down a little bit and uh, what it really means. Can, can you explain uh, what you posted about? Because you say that 40% of the CPI is mostly, uh, was it food and uh, housing and shelter? Right? Yeah, it was gasoline and shelter. It's gasoline and so, shelter, yeah. Yeah, so you look at the CPI, which had been pretty disinflationary up until uh, really end of July. And then you had the ju big jump in August, which was mostly gasoline prices. Uh, you had, I think, the the motor fuel index was up almost 11 or 12 percent just in August alone. And then September, on top of it, you had another two two percent increase in, in gasoline. That accounted for about a third of the August and September increase in the CPI. And 42 percent of it was shelter prices, and most of that is owners' equivalents rent, which is the B BLS's way of trying to. Um, trying to figure out how much it costs to live in a structure. But since most people live in their own homes, they don't have a way of keeping track of prices as it relates to shelter. So they have to ask a bunch of homeowners, what would you rent your own house out to yourself if you were going to do that, to try to get a sense of how much do you believe your own shelter price is, is worth? And so this imputation of owner's equivalent rent, which is really a lagged effect from the housing uh, from housing prices it's it's a statistical construction so that had been this that had been declining and decelerating in you know again a lagged effect from the home price uh, home prices actually declining late last year into early this year and for some reason it decided it wanted to increase and accelerate in September for reasons you know the BLS doesn't really tell us but essentially you had a large contribution from this imputation which is a made up statistical process and another large in, in, uh, con, uh, contribution from gasoline prices so when you look forward to October CPI gasoline is going to be negative we already know that and it's not likely that we're going to have another imputation for, uh, another big increase from owners equivalent rent because there's no real basis for that so looking ahead we had this short run impact, the short run, uh, short run effect from gasoline in particular on the CPI along with rents, but more macroeconomic uh, perspective, the CPI, especially moving forward, if it goes back into a disinflationary state like it was before we got into August and then late summertime, it suggests again, weakening demand that is consistent with a slowing economy moving into perhaps the recessionary stage. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I, I want to follow up with you a couple other market indicators that you're looking at that point towards a recession. Um, w what are some of the other ones you're looking at? Well, the simplest one I think most people are familiar with is the yield curve, and that's just an inversion there. Um, and you, by the way, you should pay attention to the yield curve even when it's not inverted, because there's tremendous amounts of information in the shape of the yield curve as well as how that shape changes. And so inversion of the yield curve is associated with recession because what the inverted yield curve is really saying is that market participants expect interest rates to go down from where they are today. And so over the last year, even as the Federal Reserve has raised rates, longer term rates have been has remained you know, relatively stable, even including the, the sell off of the last couple of months. Rates haven't moved all that much and nowhere near as much as the short end or monetary policy rates that the Federal Reserve and the ECB and other central banks around the government have been implementing. 
So the long end of the yield curve and even the middle and short end of the yield curve are resisting rate hikes, which has inverted the curve, which again suggests that the market is saying we expect interest rates to go lower at some point. Now we have to we have to we have to do our own homework here and try to figure out what that is because the yield curve doesn't tell us why interest rates might be going lower. But in, that's this is where the association with the recession comes in because that's one method or one means which would which would historically lead to lower interest rates in the future. So recession is a possibility, as would be a flare up in the banking crisis or some kind of deflationary uh, monetary disruption that like we saw in March and April. So the markets are still expecting a high degree of po a high possibility that for whatever reasons, and uh, they can there's plenty of them out there right now. We can see them. Interest rates are likely to be lower in the future than they were than they are today. And it's not just this one curve. It's not just U.S. Treasury yield curve. There's European curves that are inverted. The Japanese curve isn't inverted, but it's it's doing some things. Uh, the curve shape there. There are other types of curves. There are money curves like SOFR futures, Euriber futures, and they're all sending the same signal. And that is over the, uh, the entire global monetary system, this euro dollar system, the global economy, it's likely that something happens that produces central banks to cut rates, for market rates to go down, even if central banks don't cut rates, that rates are going to go lower in the future. And that has remained the constant verdict throughout the last year or so, really going back to uh, last September and October, markets have remained resolute that that's, that's the likely outcome here. Jeff, we're about two weeks away from the next FOMC meeting, November 1st. Do you expect any fireworks to come out of that? Now, I think it's going to be one other one of those where they say, we're not really sure what's going on here. They're going to couch it in the language of, okay, yeah, the CPI was whatever it was. I don't think it was all that much, but people have made a big deal of CPI. I don't think the Fed is going to say we need to we need to analyze. We need to be data dependent. Um, the September payroll report was high, but the September the payroll reports in any individual month can do that. We saw that back in May. We saw that in January. So there, while we have those types of economic uh, data points to go over, I think the Fed is still going to say a couple things. One, we want to we want to observe the what they'll say is the lagged impact of monetary policies. But really, what I think their their position is going to be is that the the, the increase in long term bond yields over the last uh, up until really recently that has that has helped them helped them in how they see uh, interest rates helping you know uh, to to um, to reduce inflation pressures across the economy. So there are several reasons why. I think they can continue the pause at the next FOMC meeting. Uh, whether or not it's appropriate, it isn't really the issue here. It's whether it's what they're what message that they're trying to send to you and me and everyone else around the economy. And I think the message they want to send is we're in the, they're in that period where they want to be more careful and constructive rather than just hey, let's just throw everything at, at rate hikes and see what happens here. No, exactly. Um, Janet Yellen, I brought her up earlier. And in, in the same Sky News interview, she also said that the interest on U.S. debt remains manageable. I know, we're at a trillion dollars roundabout there. Um, how manageable is it? And again, is, is she right or wrong on that? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a loaded question, right? Because it's, it's, there's two different, there's two different uh, perceptions. There's long run and short run. Long run, I mean, is if things don't change, obviously we have the U.S. government, which is the brokest institution in human history. We've never seen anything quite like this before, and the only reason it hasn't blown up to this point is that U.S. Treasuries are the centerpiece of this eurodollar system. So there is a monetary demand for U.S. Treasuries that has essentially overridden the any impulse that we have left from bond vigilantism, because right before, long before now. People would be looking at the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. government, and say, "I don't want to own U.S. Treasuries. There's no way these people can pay it off." But because we're in this disinflationary, deflationary environment since 2007, that has prioritized safe collateral, which, unfortunately, U.S. government debt is the safest collateral, at least in terms of its liquidity characteristics. There is this underlying demand for Treasuries, and as we go through these cyclical periods where we get into recession types of risks. There's also this cyclical demand for U.S. Treasuries, too, that allows the government to perversely take advantage of demand that has nothing to do with its credit characteristics. And so from Janet Yellen's perspective, she's like, people buy Treasuries, so I'm going to keep selling them. It doesn't seem like we can sell enough of them. 
And so you understand why some people say, well, there's got to be a limit there. And the limit really is it has to do with the, the monetary characteristics of the treasuries and how they're used, how they're actually used as financial collateral. And that leads to the longer run question, which is, OK, is there a limit at what point that the government just issues too much debt for the market to really absorb, even factoring the demand for collateral? Um, you know, and then the long run question is, is there a way to get out of it where we don't have the Treasury market blow up and the U.S. government become completely bankrupt? And there is there are definitely ways to do that. But there's it's nothing like we're we're not seeing anything that would suggest that we're, we're following along that path. So we're kind of riding the short run, uh, short run coattails of the, the, the collateral demand and financial demand and euro dollar demand, hoping and praying that 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 point doesn't get reached or that 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 we don't trigger the the real negative response from just I mean, you're right, Kaya. What is it, a trillion dollars just in the last three months or something like that? I mean, just some ridiculous numbers from the government. But yet here we are, despite all the proclamations over the last 15 years that we would have passed that threshold long ago, even after issuing a trillion dollars in treasury debt, just in the last three months, rates are relatively tame compared to what you would expect. Uh, if you were, if you didn't think, if you thought there was nothing but the, this, this, uh, the credit environment and deficit environment of the government, you would never expect that yield curve would be inverted. That long-term U.S. Treasuries are are hanging in that around four and a half, four four and three quarters percent. I mean, for my God, for the amount of, of debt that they just issued, you would think that we'd be seven double digits by now. So that goes to the you know again the misconception that Yellen that Yellen has. Hey, we can sell Treasuries and anybody will buy them. And really, why that is, and that's because of the cyclical and the, the cyclical demand as well as the underlying financial and monetary demand, which which skews everything. Yeah, interesting. Because you further added, our fiscal situation is by no means unsolvable, right? So again, like we <laughs> well, get that's something. Tr right? That's true, but there's no reason to believe that she <laughs> or anyone currently will solve it. I mean, any situation is solvable. It's do we see any signs that it's being solved? And the answer is absolutely not. There's, I mean, this is a bi bipartisan failure. There's, there's no, yeah. it's not Republicans versus Democrats here. It's politicians, it's governments. Governments do what they're going to do. And as long as they feel they can spend, they're going to spend. That's what they do. Um, and unfortunately, I, I will add, we do have the Japanese example to sadly look forward to because the Japanese have pioneered this. And this is not a good thing. The more the government does, the more the government issues debt, the more the government is able to issue debt, the more harm it has over the long run. There's long run consequences on the economy as well as the fiscal situation. But what the Japanese show is that we can be both stuck in that type of economic and monetary circumstance for a very long period of time. And it does not lead to the blow up in the government, the government debt and the, the government bond market that you would think that there should be. So. In one sense, I hate to say it, but Janet Yellen's right, but maybe for all the wrong reasons and all the reasons that we would like to fix because the consequences are extremely negative. Um, so if you're looking at the U.S. interest rates or government rates as the signal, you're looking at the wrong signal. And that's what Yellen's doing. She's saying, look, we can sell all this debt, so it must be everything's fine. When you look at the reason you can sell that debt is because everything is not fine. Yeah, and hitting the reset button is not really a solution everybody's looking forward to anyway. So no, again, there are solutions, but I'm not sure everybody would like them, right? So that's a different well, the story. I mean, Kai, the long run solution is to do what we did in the 1950s. And that's essentially to grow our way out of the problem. We had massive amounts of debt from Great Depression and World War II. We didn't, we didn't default on it. We didn't, uh, we didn't um, yeah, they de devalued the dollar, dollar based, based on gold in the 30s, but all that debt that got piled on afterwards, that there was no jubilee, there was no default. Essentially, we had two things. We had a growing economy because they fixed the monetary system with Bretton Woods. They, okay, now we've got a massive wave of global growth. And number two, the Eisenhower administration, building upon the Truman administration, they enacted a degree of fiscal sanity. They said, okay, we're going to, we're going to, we don't need to run huge deficits following the war. So let's, Let's allow the economy to grow our way out of this, this debt situation and the deficit situation. And that's exactly what happened. And that remains the pathway forward. And that's what we should be shooting at. But nobody's, I mean, we're nowhere close to even getting toward that type of, uh, the, that, that type of prospect. 
Gotcha. No, I appreciate the commentary there, Jeff. And uh, since we talked about oil prices and uh, gas prices in the U.S., we need to talk commodities here as well, um, oil in particular, but I also want to talk about gold and the role of precious metals. Um, but let, let's start with gold because, unfortunately, the conflict in the Middle East uh, stirred up oil prices here. We're above $90 again for a barrel of crude. I think it's $91 right now as we're talking. Um, how do you see that going forward, and what's your prediction for the oil price? Well, oil price, I mean, you can't predict the geopolitics, right? I mean, before we got to the conflict in the Middle East uh, last week, oil prices were obviously surging on supply factors, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, limiting the uh, production. And it's saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to extend production cuts and limit, limit uh, supply for as long as it takes to keep, well, they said keep oil prices stable, but what does stable mean in their definitions? So we had supply restricted oil moving higher, but then even Toward the end of last month and into the early part of this month, oil prices, they started to go down again. And gasoline prices, especially wholesale prices, really, they fell off a cliff. Um, and quite interestingly, gasoline prices in the U.S., wholesale gasoline prices, diverged from oil prices going back to last month, which suggests that along with the oil price decline up before the, the Middle East conflict erupted, that maybe we're seeing demand questions come back to the forefront. So we've been focused on supply moving oil prices higher, but then gas something broke in gasoline, gasoline prices fell off. Maybe so that started to spill over before Israel and Hamas and oil prices started to fall off a little bit too. So we might have a demand issue showing up in those commodities that is being masked to an extent by the geopolitics of the situation. But there isn't the geopolitics in gasoline and that one's moving lower. Gotcha. Okay, so we got to look at gas and it's like, I mean, oil and the gasoline prices very differently. Interesting commentary, because I've noticed uh, gas prices in the U.S. have come down quite a bit. Yeah, and they're uh, likely to come down a lot more because the wholesale price has really fallen off a cliff here. And in retail prices, they usually lag uh, several weeks behind. So by the end of this month, again, that's why I said, you know, CPI in October is going to look very differently. By the end of this month, retail gas prices should be down substantially. Okay, now let's bookmark that and uh, come back to that uh, once the uh, October CPI numbers come out, which is, uh, well, I had looked it up. I think Another it's month early. ahead, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, but uh, let's talk about the role of precious metals in, in that looming re uh, recession scenario and uh, moving forward. Where do you see things headed and what's the role of gold and silver here? Yeah, gold, uh, you look at gold as a hedge, sort of a, hey, the end of the world hedge or a big, big, big error kind type of hedge, not, not specifically inflation, but just to hedge against any type of really negative scenario. So that's usually the um, the uh, the overriding theme behind gold prices. And you also have to look at it in terms of the interest rate environment, because gold is always the opportunity cost of owning, owning gold is always interest rates because gold doesn't have an interest rate. So it's it's a reflection of interest rate fundamentals as well as is um, as a hedge against big potential risk, financial risk, economic risk, geopolitical risk, too. Uh, so you have the rising rate environment, or at least that's, you know, it, that's the idea that there should be gold prices should be falling based on interest rates, but they've been hanging in there um, even before the, the, the outbreak of geopolitics here. So it, it's, it's similar to the yield curve and that there's demand for gold in the face of what should be higher interest rates, which should be gold negative. And you also can compare gold to other commodities like copper and use the copper to gold ratio. Um, copper prices have been weak on obviously global economic demand fundamental uh, fundamentals, despite uh, unfavorable supply characteristics in copper. And so the copper to gold ratio has been really sort of disinflationary too. It's another one of those like the yield curve that suggests global type of re uh, global recession type of situation. Um, so. Demand for gold, demand for safety in the face of higher interest rates or supposedly higher interest rates, as well as the economic fundamentals of, and demand from copper. You look at those two things together, it's, it's sending a, a, a modestly, modestly disinflationary and recession signal. Fantastic. Jeff, I got to nail you down now. Last question. When do we see the recession? What's the date? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. And that's the thing. It's a rolling indicator because you look at... The yield curves last year really heavily inverted September, October, November. And you think, okay, we're waiting for a recession, but no, uh, Germany and Europe fell into recession almost immediately. So they've been in recession all this time. You could argue the Chinese have been in recession too, and it wasn't strictly about lockdowns. 
um, because they removed the lockdowns and the Chinese economy really didn't change all that much. So you look at you look at the global whole, the global economy as a whole. What markets were saying is that we had recession potential really show up in last last autumn, and that has been fulfilled to an extent. It maybe not to the extent that what everybody we could say, hey, there's recession everywhere, but we've been moving in that direction. Europe, Germany, as I said, they're in recession already. It looks like those are those are going to get worse. The Chinese have been struggling with something, the same types of uh, global recession pressures, as well as their own internal uh, uh, own internal problems along the same lines. So the question you're really asking is, when does the U.S. economy start to join the rest of the world in on the recession side of the ledger? And the answer is, I don't know. It might be um, when the, the for most people, it's Will the payroll report be negative? That might be an indication. Will we get a negative number in GDP? Doesn't look like it'll be in the third quarter. Um, so, is is it, when are, when are the statistics in the U.S. going to look like the rest of the world? And we, just no way to predict that because these are these are very prolonged. They're very complex processes that don't have an easy blueprint or roadmap that you can follow and say this, 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 and this. And we know the next step is going to be clear and unequivocal recession. So that's why we you know, depend upon these curves. We look around the rest of the world and say the balance of probabilities is not, is not good for a soft landing. Yeah. So April 1st, right then and there. Tough, <laughs> tough to April predict. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 something just, like that. Something like that. Fantastic. Jeff, really, really insightful discussion. Uh, where can we find more of you? Where can we learn more about the Eurodollar? You can, chat, you can follow me on Eurodollar University. That's the YouTube channel. That's the show I do on YouTube. It's Eurodollar University. You also have a website, eurodollar.university, where we have memberships and subscriptions available to talk about not just the Eurodollar, what it is and what it's supposed to do, but the conse consequences and implications of maybe why it isn't doing what it's supposed to do. So again, that's eurodollar.university and Eurodollar University on YouTube. Fantastic. You're also on X or formerly known as Twitter. I think that's yeah. the official name now, X formerly known as Twitter. Yeah, it, X. I hate you know it. It always trips you up. I'm on X. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> but you can find me on X at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP. Fantastic, Jeff. Really appreciate your time. Hope to have you back very soon. Maybe April first or before then, right around then. <laughs> and uh, we'll see what the weather is like at that time. Um, yeah, fantastic. I see what you're doing. You're setting me up for April Fools here. So that would be great. <laughs> oh, we could say March 31st. If that, if that works better. So <laughs> perfect. <laughs> awesome. Jeff, thank you so much for your time and everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this engaging discussion here with Jeff Snyder. If you did, leave a like, leave a comment. We really want to hear from you. Are we on the wrong track here? April, Fool, uh, April Fool's too late, too early. Uh, let, let us know. What do you think? How are you hedging your bets? And uh, what, what are your thoughts on a euro dollar system? Put that in the comments below. We really want to hear from you. It also helps us and helps this video and interview to be discovered more on YouTube as well. If you haven't done so, smash that subscribe button because I know 80 to 85% of you watching are not subscribed. Kindly change that. It helps us bringing people like Jeff onto the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with lots more.